This is chapter 13, Viruses, Viroids, and Prions. Viruses are too small to be seen with our normal light microscopes, and they cannot be cultured outside of a host. But advances in molecular biology techniques in the 80s and 90s led to the recognition of several new viruses, including HIV and SARS. So in this chapter, we'll look at the biology and replication of viruses, different classes of viruses, and some diseases they can cause. So the question of whether viruses are considered living organisms has been an ambiguous answer in biology. Viruses are inert, meaning they don't move or do anything outside of a living host cell, so they aren't considered living organisms in this sense of the word. Also, they cannot produce on their own, so they're only really, quote, alive when they're able to multiply in a host cell that they infect. Sometimes viruses are considered alive in the clinical sense because they can cause infections and diseases just like other pathogenic organisms do. Viruses are considered obligatory intracellular parasites. So they are obligated to be parasites inside of another cell. So it just means they require a living host cell to multiply. They can't replicate on their own. They can contain DNA or RNA, but never both simultaneously. They do not have a cell membrane, but instead a more simple protein coating that surrounds the nucleic acid. They have no ribosome, so they have no way to make their own proteins. Um, and they also have no way to generate their own ATP. So comparing viruses to cells... So virus structure is very simple. So genetic material in a protein caps it, whereas cells are more complex with a cell membrane, the cytoplasm, also a nucleus and organelles in your eukaryotes. Cells can reproduce independently, either asexually or sexually, whereas viruses can only reproduce within a host cell. Viruses are not able to grow and develop on their own. They also cannot obtain and use energy or respond to the environment. However, they can change over time in the sense of evolution. So because viruses must use the metabolic machinery of the host cell, it's important in the development of antiviral drugs that we don't interfere with the function of the host cell. Because most drugs that would interfere with the viral multiplication would also impact the function of our host cell. Host range is the spectrum of host cells or types of cells a virus can infect. Most viruses are only going to infect specific types of cells in one host or species. Rarely can they cross their host species, but it does happen. So an example is dogs don't get measles like we do. They don't have to get vaccinated against measles. So this host specificity is determined by the specific attachment sites on the host cell surface. So these viruses are going to have to chemically interact with specific receptor sites on that host cell surface. Viruses that infect bacteria are specifically referred to as bacteriophages or sometimes just phage. There's potential use of viruses in disease treatment because of those narrow host ranges. So we can kind of target and kill certain types of host cells. So phage therapy is using bacteriophages to treat bacterial infections because bacteriophages are only going to infect and kill the bacterial cells and not the human that has the infection. Some viruses may also be able to infect and kill tumor cells, either naturally or by genetic modification. Because viruses are so small, their sizes are determined by the super high-powered scanning electron microscopy. Viruses are smaller than bacteria and can range from 20 to 1,000 nanometers in length. So this is showing the comparative sizes of a human red blood cell next to an E. coli bacterial cell. And then here are some viruses compared to the size of our E. coli cell. So looking at viral structure, a viroid is just an infectious RNA without a capsid protein coat, so it's just kind of some naked genetic material. A virion is a complete, fully developed viral particle composed of its nucleic acid surrounded by that protein coat. Viruses can be classified by their nucleic acids and differences in their structures of these protein coats. So nucleic acids could be DNA, 
or RNA, right? and then it could be single-stranded or double-stranded, or it could be linear or circular. So lots of diversity in the types of nucleic acids in these viruses. Capsid is the protein coat made of these subunits called capsomere. So every little ball right, is one capsomere. The entire coating around this nucleic acid is your capsid. This is just going to help protect that nucleic acid. An envelope is a lipid, protein, and carbohydrate coating that some viruses may have. So it's very similar to a cell membrane. So it's just an extra layer of protection um, around that protein coat. Some of these enveloped viruses may have spikes or projections on their outer surface that help aid in attachment to the host cell. So it makes them kind of more sticky, so they're able to stick and attach to these host cells they infect. These spikes are also going to give the influenza virus its ability to clump the red blood cell of its host. So your non-enveloped viruses are just viruses that have the naked capsid, so they're not covered by that lipid envelope. So when a host cell is infected by a virus, the host's immune system will produce specific antibodies against the surface proteins of that virus. However, a lot of viruses can escape antibody detection because they're genes that code for the surface proteins, right? So remember, all genes are are instructions for specific proteins. So if we change those instructions, these surface proteins are more subject to mutation. Right? So we'll change their shape and our antibodies from before will now no longer recognize them. So this is why we have to get new flu shots every year because it mutates over that time. So the flu shot you got last year is not going to be effective against the new protein shapes of this year's strain of flu. Viruses are classified into several different types based on the structure of these capsids. So helical viruses have hollow cylindrical shaped capsids. Rabies and Ebola are examples of helical viruses. Polyhedral viruses have many sides. So poly just means many, hedral means side. So these have many sides. Um, and polio is an example of a polyhedral. Enveloped viruses uh, are roughly spherical, right, though their capsid shape can vary inside the envelope. Some examples of enveloped viruses include influenza and herpes. And finally, complex viruses. So these have complex, complicated structures that don't really fit into these other categories. So an example of a complex virus shape is a bacteriophage. So this is kind of actually what they really look like. They look kind of like these little alien structures with these legs, um, and then they inject their genetic material into the cell. Viruses were once classified based on their symptoms, but new DNA technology has allowed for more accurate grouping of these viruses. So generally the genus name will end in virus and the family name will end in viridae. A viral species is just any group of viruses that share the same genetic information in the same host range or ecological niche right, or habitat. So in this case viruses habitat is host cells. So unlike plants and animals, we don't actually use um, actual species names for viruses, but instead they're typically designated by some type of descriptive common name. Um, and any subspecies or strains would be designated by a number. So example would be herpes simplex virus 1, herpes simplex virus 2. So, so SARS-CoV-2 is severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. So the common name, right, SARS, kind of descriptive of the type of disease it causes, causes severe acute respiratory infection, um, and it's caused by a coronavirus, and this is the second strain um, from this group. So COVID-19 is actually the name of the disease caused by this virus. So similar to how HIV is the name of the virus, but it causes the disease called AIDS. So in order to grow viruses in the laboratory, they must be grown in living cells. Because remember, they are those obligate intracellular parasites. Right? So they're obligated to infect these host cells in order to reproduce. They can't reproduce on their own. So bacteriophages are going to be grown in bacteria. So we'll have a lawn growth of bacteria on a plate. 
and apply the bacteriophage viruses, which form plaques or just these clearing zones on the surface of the auger. So wherever there's a clearing means that the virus has killed those bacterial cells. Each plaque can correspond to a single virus um, and expressed as what's called a plaque forming unit. Viruses are too small to be seen without a high powered electron microscope, although some may be identified based on their cytopathic effects in cell cultures. So this is showing an example of an infected pap smear. So the HPV virus causes these physical changes in the appearance of the cervical cells. So virally infected cells are detected via their deterioration or cytopathic effect, its effect on the cell itself. Serological tests are most commonly used to identify viruses. Western blotting tests the reaction of our virus with certain antibodies. So the Western blotting process involves that separation by gel electrophoresis. So remember, we put the restriction enzymes in our DNA sample to cut it into small fragments. We put the fragments in the gel, apply an electrical charge that's going to kind of magnetically draw the DNA toward the bottom of the gel. The smaller fragments will move further through the gel toward the bottom. The larger fragments will be stuck closer to the top. So then we transfer our gel right, to another membrane and we stain it with our antibody serum. So if the virus is present, you know, if it expresses those surface proteins that we're looking for, um, then our antibodies will bind to it and give us a signal, allowing us to identify and diagnose that particular infection. Other new molecular methods for identifying nucleic acids can also be used in viral identification. So the use of those RIFLIPS, right, or those DNA fragments, and PCR, or that nucleic acid amplification. So DNA replication in a test tube. We can start with a very small sample, and then within a short period of time, have an exponential increase in the number of copies of that DNA. The nucleic acids in viruses only contain a few of the genes needed to synthesize new viruses. So things like the enzymes for protein synthesis, ribosomes, the tRNA, the nucleotides, and ATP energy production are all provided by the host cell. So therefore, for a virus to multiply, it must invade the host cell and take over the host's metabolic machinery. So again, they are obligate intracellular parasites. This is the only way they can reproduce is to kind of hijack and hack into a host cell and use its ribosomes and enzymes to make new viruses. A single virion can give rise to several or thousands of similar viruses from a single host cell. This process can drastically change the host cell and usually can cause its death. In a few infections, the host cell can actually survive and continue producing those viruses indefinitely. The multiplication of viruses is demonstrated with a one-step growth curve. So following the initial infection, complete assembled viruses cannot be found in the host cell. So at this point, the cell is just making all of the separate components. So we're copying the DNA, we're making the proteins. Um, so we can't actually detect any fully formed viruses. So this is called the eclipse period. Right? So a number of viruses um, virtually goes down to nothing. So as the cell begins to assemble the viruses and they're released, right, then we have this increase in our number of viruses um, released from the host cell during an acute infection. Most infected cells will die after infection. Um, they're going to essentially rupture and release all the new viruses. So at this point, we have this drop off where new viruses are no longer being produced. Bacteriophages can multiply by two alternative mechanisms, the lytic cycle or the lysogenic cycle. In the lytic cycle, the phage will cause lysis or rupturing of the cell and ultimately its death. The lysogenic cycle is where the phage DNA is actually incorporated into the host DNA. So it's kind of hiding in the host cell DNA and therefore being replicated as the cell replicates. But ultimately, the host cell remains alive with the lysogenic cycle. 
Lysogenic cycle involves phage conversion, so where we have the viral DNA incorporated into the bacterial DNA. So we have converted that chromosome to carry viral DNA. Lysogenic cycle can also involve specialized transduction. So transduction was where the bacterial DNA was kind of inadvertently packaged into new viruses. But with specialized transduction, it's not inadvertent. It's a more targeted uh, process. Lytic cycle has five distinct phases. So step one is attachment. Our phage has to attach, make contact to the surface of the host cell by those tail fibers. Step two, penetration. Phage lysozyme enzyme will break down a portion of the cell wall and allowing the tail sheath to contract and force the core of that tail and its DNA into the cell. So this function is very similar to a hypodermic needle to inject its DNA. Biosynthesis is the production of phage DNA and proteins using the host cell's metabolic machinery. So the host protein synthesis is usually repressed by the virus. So the cell is only making viral proteins now, no longer making the cell's own proteins that it needs. So this biosynthesis is going to be that eclipse period on that one-step growth curve. So right now we have no fully formed viruses to be found, right? We just have all the separate pieces. Step four is maturation. So now we're going to assemble these phage particles into complete virions. And finally, the last step five is release. So the viruses are now fully formed. The host cell will rupture and release these newly produced phages to infect other nearby cells and repeat this viral multiplication cycle. In the lysogenic cycle, the phage remains latent or inactive, so it's not going to kill or rupture the host cell right away. Phage DNA incorporates into the host cell DNA by recombination. Inserted phage DNA is known as a prophage. So when the host cell replicates its own chromosome, it will also replicate our prophage DNA. This prophage DNA will remain latent or dormant until some type of spontaneous trigger will lead to its excision and activation, and then begin the lytic cycle to produce new viruses. The three important results of this lysogenic cycle and lysogeny is that the lysogenic cells that have these prophages are going to be immune to reinfection by the same phage. It also can result in phage conversion. So these host cells may exhibit some new properties as they're carrying this viral DNA. Specialized transduction is possible um, when specific bacterial genes are transferred or picked up in a phage coat and transferred to another bacteria. So this ultimately changes the genetic properties of that bacterial cell. Multiplication of animal viruses follows the same basic pattern of the bacteriophage multiplication, but it has one extra step. So step one, attachment. The virus has to attach to the cell membrane proteins. Um, animal viruses don't have those tail fibers to make them kind of stick to the surface. It's important to understand the nature of viral attachment because it can help lead to development of antiviral drugs. Step two is entry by either receptor-mediated endocytosis, so where there's receptors that, that bind to the virus and kind of bring it in by endocytosis, with the cell membrane folding inward to form a vesicle. So it's not going to inject naked DNA like the penetration step in bacteriophages. So instead of having a penetration, we just have a entry. It's not as hostile. Enveloped viruses can also enter by fusion. So the lipid envelope on the virus can just fuse with the lipid membrane on the cell. Uncoating is then done by viral or host enzymes. So separation of the nucleic acid from the protein coat. Biosynthesis, these the production of the nucleic acid and the proteins. Maturation is where we're going to assemble those individual components right, to form fully developed virus particles. And then finally, release. So animal viruses can release by rupture, similar to 
um, the lytic cycle where the cell just ruptures and releases the new viruses um, or enveloped viruses may release by budding. So budding release because right, the enveloped viruses, envelope is the same type of molecule, that lipid membrane um, of the host cell, it can fuse outward right, or exocytosis out of the cell without rupturing the membrane. DNA viruses are viruses that replicate their DNA in the nucleus of the host using viral enzymes. They also synthesize their capsid proteins and other proteins in the cytoplasm using the host cell enzymes. So we have our attachment of our DNA virus. In this example, it's a Popova virus, so HPV. So entry and encoding, so we remove the capsid proteins and have the exposed viral DNA. So it then replicates within the nucleus and the RNA is going to be translated in the cytoplasm to make the new virus proteins. Some examples of DNA viruses include the adenoviridae family. So they are double-stranded DNA non-enveloped viruses. So your typical acute respiratory diseases like the common cold. Because they don't have an envelope, their capsomeres and their capsid is just kind of exposed. Pox viridae is double-stranded DNA virus that does have an envelope. So this family of viruses causes skin lesions in cowpox and smallpox. Herpes viridae is double-stranded DNA um, in an enveloped virus. There are several strains in the herpes viridae family. These viruses include herpes simplex viruses that cause cold sores. Uh, the varicella virus causes chicken pox. Uh, the virus that causes infectious mononucleosis, uh, roseola, Kaposi sarcoma virus, all belong to this herpes viridae family. Popova viridae contains double-stranded DNA and is non-enveloped. This includes the papilloma virus. It can cause warts and cervical cancer. Papadnaviridae is the family that includes the hepatitis B virus. So this is a double-stranded DNA virus that does contain an envelope. So Hepadnaviridae just stands for hepatitis DNA virus. This virus is unique from other DNA viruses because it uses reverse transcriptase to make DNA from RNA. Retroviruses are the only other known family of viruses that use reverse transcriptase. So we talked about reverse transcriptase before. It's an enzyme that just does transcription in reverse. So we go from, instead of going from DNA to RNA to protein, we go from RNA back to DNA in reverse. The biosynthesis of RNA viruses is essentially the same as in DNA viruses, except RNA viruses are going to multiply in the cytoplasm using RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So the viral genes cause the enzyme RNA polymerase to be made by the host cell. So this will catalyze the synthesis of another strand of RNA, which will be complementary to the original infecting strand. There's a few different types of RNA viruses, depending on what type of RNA strand they have. So in single-stranded RNA positive sense strand, the viral DNA is essentially the same as mRNA for protein synthesis. So it carries those instructions for that particular protein. So positive sense just means that this RNA makes sense, right? So we talked about the sense codons and non-sense codons. The sense codons contribute to the protein. The non-sense codons don't code for an amino acid, right? Those are your like your stop codons. So single-stranded RNA positive sense strand, right? It's basically the same as RNA for protein synthesis, mRNA. So the virus infects the cell. We have entry encoding, right? Expose the viral genome, our single strand positive sense RNA. So we'll make a copy of the positive strand using that to make a negative strand. So the negative antisense strand, right? The lighter colored. So we have original strand. We make a copy, a complementary copy of the mRNA, right, which think would be the same sequence as our tRNAs, our transfer RNAs in protein synthesis. Right? So the tRNAs aren't the ones that are coding for the amino acids. Right? They're the ones that are 
have the anticodons, right? they just deliver the amino acids. So we have essentially our mRNA right, and our antisense copy. So then we use this negative sense, antisense copy, to make new mRNA positive sense. So now this positive sense, mRNA, essentially can be translated into those new viral proteins. Some examples of single strand RNA positive sense viruses include picornaviridae, which are non enveloped. So these are your enteroviruses, um, poliovirus, the common cold rhinovirus, and the hepatitis A virus. So these are just polyhedral capsids with no envelope. Togaviridae is enveloped, causes the rubella. Disease. So think of toga, kind of like the Roman Greek togas or college fraternity toga party. Right? It just means kind of a coat. Um, and coronaviridae is an enveloped virus um, that causes COVID-19. So it has these spike proteins on its surface and a single strand of RNA. So a potential bonus question on your next exam, what type of virus causes COVID-19 or what type of virus is uh, SARS-CoV-2? It is a single strand RNA positive sense virus. Single strand RNA negative antisense strand is the same sequence as that tRNA. So it's not going to be able to undergo translation and code for those proteins. So we have to transcribe a positive strand first to serve as our mRNA for protein synthesis. We start with our negative strand, and then we use that to make a positive strand. And then, as we saw with the previous class, uh, the positive sense viruses, then we'll just go back and make another template strand. So we just kind of go back and forth, back and forth, until we get all the proteins and copies that we need for the new viruses. An example of a single strand RNA negative antisense virus is rhabdoviridae or the rabies virus, lysovirus. Double strand RNA viruses just contain both an mRNA positive sense strand and an antisense negative strand. So because they have both copies already, they can undergo translation um, and replication immediately. We don't have to have that extra step of making copies from our original strand. So the double-stranded RNA viral genome right, will separate. One strand will be used in translation of viral protein, and the other strand will be used to make copies of the viral genome. An example of a virus family um, is rioviridae, so just rotavirus, so common respiratory or digestive infections. So there are one family of viruses that are technically an RNA virus, but they use DNA. So their single-stranded RNA virus is going to produce DNA. So this is the retroviridae family. So we said the hepatinoviridae um, was the only other family that uses this reverse transcriptase besides the retroviruses. Reverse transcriptase means retro. And again, retro just means kind of moving backwards. So we're going backwards from mRNA to produce DNA. So in retroviruses, the viral DNA will integrate into the host chromosome as a provirus, so similar to the prophage in that lysogenic cycle. So it's kind of hidden within the host chromosome. So the provirus would then be protected from the host's own immune system and most antiviral drugs. So this is why it's difficult to treat these types of viruses like HIV because in order to kill the virus, you also have to kill the host cell. So once the viral DNA is incorporated into the host DNA, it'll be transcribed and translated by the host cell as usual. Several types of cancers, about 10%, are now known to be caused by viruses. So some of these cancers may develop long after a viral infection, um, and they're not contagious. Some other viral infections are. Basically, anything that can alter the genetic material of a cell has the potential to become cancerous. Oncogenes are genes that can transform a normal cell into cancer. So these are genes that are normally inactive, but some type of trigger can activate them. So maybe a mutagen, radiation, or an oncogenic virus. 
So oncogenic viruses can become integrated into a host cell's DNA um, and cause changes in that cell and cause cancer growth and induce tumors. So this defining feature of the oncoviruses, their ability to integrate into the host cell DNA, is very similar to what we saw with the lysogeny in bacteria. Some examples of some DNA oncogenic viruses include endoviridae, uh, herpes viridae, causing the Epstein-Barr virus, pox viridae, papova viridae, the human papillomavirus that can cause cervical cancer, um, and hepadnaviridae, so hepatitis B virus can cause liver cancer. RNA oncogenic viruses include the retroviridae family, okay, so that single-stranded RNA that produces DNA. So the viral RNA will be transcribed to DNA using reverse transcriptase, um, and it can integrate itself into the host cell DNA. So retroviruses like HIV can cause T-cell leukemia or lymphoma. So that's typically how people die from HIV and AIDS, um, is the virus attacks their immune system, the T-cells, um, that help activate and manage their overall immune system. So if you cripple the immune system, the person can't even fight off basic simple infection. So most people that die of AIDS don't die from the virus itself. They die from these secondary infections. There are three basic patterns that viral infections can have. An acute infection is your stereotypical cold or flu where you're sick for a few days um, and then your body fights it off and it's, it's gone. A latent virus can remain asymptomatic in the host for long periods of time and eventually can reactivate due to changes in immunity. Some examples of a latent infection would be cold sores um, or the shingles from latent chickenpox infections. So the chickenpox that you were infected with as a child is still kind of laying dormant in your body that all of a sudden one day as you're an adult, many decades later, it can reappear as shingles. A persistent viral infection is going to occur gradually over time. So it's not laying dormant. It is kind of reproducing um, just very slowly. So it's gradually increasing over long periods of time. Um, so these would be chronic infections and are generally fatal. Um, so things like measles, HPV, HIV, and hepatitis. Prions are proteinaceous infectious particles. So we know that they're only protein-based because the infectiousness is decreased when treated with a protease right, or a uh, protein digesting enzyme, but their infectiousness is not affected by radiation. So this suggests that there's no actual genetic material, uh, that it's got to be pure protein. Prions may be inherited or transmitted by ingestion, transplant, or from surgical instruments but they all share the same um, symptoms and cause neurological disease, cause spongiform encephalopathy. So spongiform as in it's going to form large vacuoles or holes in the brain tissue to give it kind of a spongy appearance. Mad cow disease is the most well-known prion-caused infection, so it's bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Um, some other Examples include creutzfeldt jakob disease, uh, fatal familial insomnia, and Kuru. So Kuru is a disease, prion disease in humans, that was discovered um, in Papua New Guinea from uh, eating human brain tissue. So they were essentially practicing cannibalism and led to this Kuru disease outbreak. So essentially you have a normal shaped protein, so everything goes back to structure reflects function. So a prion is just a misfolded protein, so it doesn't have the right structure, so it's not going to function properly. Prion disease is caused by the conversion of a normal host protein into the infectious form. So the PRPC is the normal prion protein that's typically on a cell surface, so it's the correct shape. The PRPSC, the scrapie protein, so this is the infectious prion protein. These scrapie proteins can accumulate in the brain cells and form those plaques. 
So in this example, the prion theory, right, we have a nerve cell that makes normal, right, green proteins. Um, and then something happens, right, we're exposed to one of these abnormal scrapey proteins, um, but it's going to trigger kind of a domino effect. So any neighboring protein uh, would also be converted to that misfolded shape. And then again, kind of like a domino effect, it's just going to spread from protein to protein. But unlike our normal prion proteins um, that have enzymes to kind of break them down naturally, these enzymes don't work on the abnormal prion proteins. So they're not going to be destroyed right, or cleaned out of the cell. So they just kind of accumulate and eventually will kill the cell and it will stop functioning. So once the cell dies, now all of these prion proteins will move on to other cells and begin the cycle again. So finally, one last potential bonus question on your next test. So we've all seen zombie movies and zombie shows The Walking Dead, but how realistic would that be? So would that actually be possible for some type of zombie apocalypse? Well, for your bonus question, if a zombie apocalypse were to happen, the most probable type of infectious agent would be a prion. So it probably wouldn't be a bacteria or a virus that gets us. It's going to be this prion disease. So we already see this in nature right, with the zombie deer disease uh, that they're worried could actually jump to humans. So it's sometimes referred to as the chronic wasting disease um, in these hoofed mammals. But as people are hunting them and eating them, they could potentially be exposed to those prions um, of these zombie deer and it could then jump and make the leap into humans.